Hi everyone, Dr. Bruce here. So um, I I realized that energy systems is kind of a difficult topic, you know, for these courses, and it's unfortunate that Bio 200 begins with the cells and chemistry. So what I thought I'd do is do a short, a very short lecture video, and just kind of go over these energy systems again, like what's important. This may help you for the midterm exam. So the first thing you want to know is that uh, the important molecule here is ATP or, or adenosine triphosphate, which consists of an adenosine molecule and three phosphates. So this is like the little energy molecule in the body that stores energy and then it releases energy so that the body can function. So muscles use it, uh, you know, different cells use it, and you can't live without ATP. So where is the energy stored in ATP? It's stored in what's called a high energy phosphate bond. It's that third phosphate. When it's released, when the phosphate you know, disengages, it releases energy. And then you can store energy by adding a phosphate to adenosine diphosphate. So that's what this says. This is my activity on this. All right, so the whole idea here is what do these energy systems do? What they're going to do is they're going to make AD, ATP. So how do they make it? They make it by adding a phosphate to ADP. So you have a molecule with two phosphates, you add a phosphate and you're storing energy. And then that phosphate can break off and then you can use the energy. Right, and that's what this says. So the first energy system we're going to look at is, so, so the idea here with energy systems is that you have one main system. That's the aerobic system that consists of two parts, which are called the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain. So those both com com comprise the aerobic energy system. Then you have two helper systems that help out when you need extra energy. And one of these is the ATP phosphocreatine system. That's this one. So there is a molecule <clears throat> called phosphocreatine, which consists of a creatine and a phosphate. And the phosphate simply just breaks off and then adds to ADP to make ATP, because that's the goal of all these energy systems, is to make ATP. So where's this phosphocreatine? It's stored near the muscles, and you have a, a certain amount of it, only enough for about 10 seconds of intense activity. This is an anaerobic system and does not use oxygen. So if you had to say you had to lift something really heavy for just a few seconds, this system would kick in and produce energy to power your muscles. So intense energy lasting about 10 seconds. The next system is a more complicated system called glycolysis. And there's what is called the anaerobic portion of glycolysis or anaerobic glycolysis. This is also a helper system. So in this system, this system will provide ATP for about three minutes of intense activity. Again, it's considered anaerobic. Glycolysis occurs in the cytosol or cytoplasm of the cell. So here's the fuel. The, fu the fuel is glucose. So glucose is a major fuel in the body. Glucose enters the system, and then it goes through a whole bunch of reactions. So I don't think it's important that we go through every single reaction. So what I did is I simplified it and just created a box and called it glycolysis. What you need to know then is what goes in and what comes out of glycolysis and essentially how it works. You don't have to know all the details. So glucose goes in goes into these you know, reactions. Other things that go in are ATP. So gee, we're supposed to make ATP, but now we're putting ATP into the system. You actually have to prime the system by putting a couple of ATP in. But then four come out, so you have a net gain of two ATP for every molecule of glucose that enters. You also get these other energy molecules called NADH. You get a couple of these coming out as well. And we'll talk about what these do in just a couple of minutes. And then what comes out of glycolysis is two molecules of pyruvic acid. So here's the trick, and this is what kind of confuses people sometimes. If you're exercising intensely for up to three minutes and then you stop, this, cons this whole system is considered anaerobic. And the pyruvic acid converts to lactic acid. 
and lactic acid makes your muscles sore. So if you were just exercising really intensively for up to three minutes and then you stopped and you rested and you did it again, you would probably experience some muscle soreness. Here's an example. Let's say you join a health club, right? And you haven't exercised in a long time. So you join the health club and they say in your first visit, you can work with a personal trainer. So you do. So the trainer takes you through all the pieces of equipment and you know, you want to, you know, sort of impress the trainer. So you tell them to put it on the maximal weight that you can lift, which you shouldn't do, but that's what you do for this example. So you put it on the maximal weight, you do three sets of 10, which takes about three minutes. And then you go on to the next piece of equipment, do three sets of 10, you know, up to three minutes and so on until you go through all the equipment. So what happens? The next day you wake up, you feel terrible. You have lots of soreness because you've produced a lot of lactic acid. So there are sports that um, primarily use this system and they and athletes produce the lactic acid. So what do they do to get rid of the lactic acid? They exercise very slowly, kind of move around, drink a lot of water, and that flushes the lactic acid out of the system. So that's what happens when you exercise, you know, in an intense way up to three minutes. So what happens if you exercise more than three minutes? Well, you don't convert the pyruvic acid to lactic acid. What you do is the pyruvic acid converts to acetyl coenzyme A, which I call the magic molecule because not only glucose becomes acetyl coenzyme A, but also fats and proteins can become, can you know, be converted to acetyl coenzyme A through different biochemical processes. All right, so that is anaerobic glycolysis. All right, so what happens to the acetyl coenzyme A? It enters the aerobic systems, which are located in the mitochondrion. And the first one of these is the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. And it's a cycle because it repeats. And you can look at all of these reactions, but you don't really have to know any of these. I mean, usually what happens, people memorize them and then they forget them and they memorize them again and forget them. Um, the acetyl coenzyme A enters, what you need to know is what comes off of the Krebs cycle. So for every acetyl coenzyme A that enters, you get three NADHs and you get an FADH2, another energy molecule, and you get an ATP. So for every molecule of acetyl coenzyme A that enters, three NADHs, one FADH2, one ATP. Now keep in mind that the glucose molecule in glycolysis got split into two molecules of pyruvic acid. So glucose is a six carbon molecule, pyruvic acid is a three carbon molecule. So glucose got split, you know, became split. So you really have two molecules of acetyl coenzyme A that enter this from one molecule of glucose. That means this thing goes around twice and you get six NADHs, two FADH2s, and two ATPs for the molecule of glucose. So you have to read how the, if you get a question on this, you have to read it carefully. If the question asks you how many molecules of NADH are produced from one molecule of acetyl coenzyme A. This goes around once, the answer is three. If it asks you how many molecules of NADH are produced by one molecule of glucose, this goes around twice. So it's six NADHs. All right, let's go to the next part. <clears throat> so what what is NADH and what is FADH2. These are molecules that also store energy, but they're different than ATP. ATP stores energy in the high phosphate, high energy phosphate bond. NADH and FADH store energy in their electrons. They have high energy electrons. And so these electrons start to move to lower energy levels and they release the energy and that can be used to do something in what's called the electron transport chain. So these two molecules are used in the electron transport chain, which is also in the mitochondrial membrane called the cristae. <clears throat> so here it is, here's the electron transport chain. What is it? It consists of a number of protein complexes. So what's the, what's the deal here? The, the sound bite, the bottom line is, what happens 
with these protein complexes is simply they transport hydrogen ions from one side of the membrane to the other. That's all they do. They just take a hydrogen ion and transport it to the other side. They're creating a hydrogen ion or proton gradient. So where do they get the energy to do this? They get the energy from NADH and FADH2. And all of these complexes then are just moving electrons to lower energy levels so that the work can be used to move hydrogen ions, or protons they're called, from one side of the membrane to the other. That's it. That's as simple as, I, when I explain this in class, I say it's like ping pong balls. Each hydrogen ion is a ping pong ball, you just move it across, so you're creating a huge gradient with lots of ping pong balls on this side. NADH then uh, comes in at the first protein complex, so it can, you know, produce a little more energy. FADH comes in at the second complex, and this one is, is actually coenzyme Q10, so it produces a little less energy. So you've got all the ping pong balls on one side. What happens then? The final membrane protein is very important. This is ATP synthase. What this one does is it uses the proton gradient to make ATP. So think of all the ping pong balls on this side rolling down, going through a hole, coming out here, and every time one goes through, it cranks out an ATP by adding a phosphate to ADP. So it turns out that each NADH carries enough energy in the electrons to make three ATPs, whereas each FADH2 only carries enough energy to make two ATPs. All right, so you may see that question as well. What else happens? Why is this aerobic? Because oxygen is the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. Oxygen comes in and combines with hydrogen to form water. So this system makes water and it uses oxygen. So you're, it's interesting that your metabolic systems in your body actually produce some water. It's like 150 mils a day or something. All right, so hopefully this helps you understand these energy systems a little bit better. I know they're complicated, but this sort of gets at the, you know, the essence of what you need to know with regard to these energy systems. All right, hope this helps. Thanks for watching and see you next time.